Lucy Letby, on each of the seven offences of murder and the seven offences of attempted murder, I sentence you to imprisonment for life. Because the seriousness of your offences is exceptionally high, I direct that the early release provisions do not apply. The order of the court, therefore, is a whole life order on each and every offence, and you will spend the rest of your life in prison. The lives of newborn or relatively newborn babies were ended almost as soon as they began, and lifelong harm has been caused, all in horrific circumstances. Loving parents have been robbed of their cherished children, and others have to live with the physical and mental consequences of your actions. Siblings have been deprived of brothers and sisters. You have caused deep psychological trauma, brought enduring grief and feelings of guilt, caused strains in relationships and disruption to the lives of all the families of all your victims. The great majority of your victims suffered acute pain as a result of what you did to them. They all fought for survival. Some, sadly, struggled in vain and died. That was the moment Mr Justice Goss, the judge in the Lucy Letby trial, sentenced her to a whole life term. He said her crimes were so exceptional, so serious and so cruel that she should never be released from prison. Today's sentencing hearing at Manchester Crown Court came three days after the neonatal nurse was convicted by a jury of murdering seven babies and attempting to kill six more. Instead of caring for the babies, she attacked them, injecting them with air, overfeeding them with milk and violently assaulting them. She's now one of the UK's most prolific child serial killers and today in court we heard in graphic detail the suffering she caused to the parents and to their children. In today's episode we'll bring you all the detail of what happened in court and we should warn you some of what you will hear is extremely distressing. Welcome to episode 53, The Sentence. So Liz, we heard there the comments from the judge at the top of the episode sentencing Lucy Letby to a whole life tariff. We'll have more of his comments later on in the podcast, but just walk us through what happened in court, what time things got started and how long things took. The court assembled as usual around 10 o'clock this morning and it's fair to say that it was packed. The public gallery was full of families, of the babies involved Obviously, the police officers were there, all the media were there, and eight members of the jury actually returned to hear Mr Justice Goss's sentencing. Yeah, because on Friday, of course, he invited them to return today for the sentencing, and basically most of them did. Yeah, and thanked them for their doing their public duty over such a long time, and yeah, eight of the 11 turned up to listen to what he had to say. There was one person missing today, Liz. Yeah, um, you may have read reports over the weekend, Caroline, uh, about prisoners who don't come up from the cells to hear their fate. And Lucy Letby indicated last week that she wouldn't be present in court for the sentencing hearing and she didn't appear in the dock. She was there, wasn't she? We know she was driven to court today. Yeah, we know that she was driven to court, but she just refused to come up from the cells. Some of the families uh, branded her a coward, saying that, you know, that she's cheated them out of justice. You have to have some sympathy for that, that she refused to face the music and face them. She's not the only defendant who's been convicted of really serious crimes to not arrive for the sentencing, to refuse to come out mm. of their cell, if you like, for the sentencing. A lot of comments today, I've done interviews today about this very topic, so have you. Yeah. We both heard Robert Buckland on the radio saying, you know, maybe forcing somebody out of their cell isn't the way forward, but what about streaming the sentence into their cell? Yeah, and some of the families told me that they would support that idea that, you know, really people like Letby should have nowhere to hide. It shouldn't be up to them to control whether they listen to them or listen to the judge. They should be forced to do it. It seems skewed in the wrong direction that victims don't have their day in court when... You know, you could argue that Letby's controlled this court process from the beginning because she pleaded not guilty, she refused to admit what she'd done, put the families through this torture of a 10-month trial. Mm. And then at the final hurdle, when 
she's convicted and they were hoping that, that she would finally face them and face up to what she'd done. She just refuses and, and, and is allowed to, to do that. She was given a whole life term because of the serious nature of her crimes. And a um, whole life term, actually, Caroline, for every single offence, including yes. every single attempted murder, which is quite unusual. She joins about 60 prisoners who are also serving a whole life term. They include people like Wayne Cousins, Levi Belfield, Hasham Abidi, Stephen Port and Dale Cregan. They're all currently serving whole life terms, as is becoming common practice in serious cases like this. The judge's comments were filmed. It's the only bit of the whole process that is allowed to be filmed. That's why the comments you've heard at the opening of the podcast today are actually his words spoken to the court today. He didn't really hold back on his comments. He was scathing and utterly appalled and sickened by what she'd done. He actually described her offences as a cruel, calculated and cynical campaign of child murder. So the way it started today was that some of the families in this case had written their victim impact statements. This is their chance to have their say. The trial process is quite forensic. Nicola Evans talked to us about how the evidence is delivered in like quite a blunt manner. In a way, you have to keep it emotionless because they have to make sure that the jury have kind of got the evidence without too much emotion in it. But this is the first time really that we'll have heard from a lot of the mums and dads of the babies involved and it's their chance to just ex really explain how these terrible crimes have impacted on their family, on their lives and on their wider families' lives. We always knew this was a massive human tragedy. But again, I think just hearing these statements really brings it home and that's why we're going to run these statements not quite in full, but, but nearly in full. But nearly in full. Probably should say, Caroline, there was a lot of tears in the courtroom today. You know, not only from the families, some of the jurors were in tears. You know, some of the media were welling up and were struggling to hold it back. And you know, even at the end, the judge looked quite emotional when he was addressing the the families and like thanking them for their dignity and behaviour in the court throughout the trial. So it was quite a. I found it quite a tough hearing to sit through this morning. I have to admit. What you're about to hear is how parents have been left with feelings of guilt, suffer from anxiety and depression, and how their marriages and relationships have been damaged. Some of them spoke of contemplating suicide or being too fearful to have any more children. Others whose children survived recounted details of how their futures have been permanently blighted. So, we'll start with the mother of baby A and baby B. Baby A was the first victim of Lucy Letby's campaign of murder, which began in June 2015, as we know. He and his twin sister were both attacked by having air injected into their bloodstreams by Lucy Letby. Baby B survived that attack thanks to the actions primarily of the doctors and nurses on the ward, but her brother did not. Here's what their mum told the court in a statement that she wrote, and it was read out by the prosecuting barrister Philip Asprey. 2015 was going to be the best year of our lives. We were going to become parents to a little boy and a little girl. Everything was perfect. Our babies were doing well in the neonatal unit. We were told that baby B needed a little bit of extra help, but was doing well, and that baby A was very strong and doing really well. Never could we have imagined that the most precious things in our lives would have been placed in harm's way and in the care of a nurse who is capable of such despicable actions. We never got to hold our little boy while he was alive because you took him away. What should have been the happiest time of our lives had become our worst nightmare. After losing baby A, not only were we absolutely traumatised at what had happened, we were riddled with fear for our baby girl. We weren't there when baby A collapsed, and by the time I was brought through to him, he was gone, despite all the efforts to revive him. You had been successful in your quest to cause maximum pain and suffering. We are so thankful that we had that fear for baby B as it saved her life, not allowing you to fully do the same to her. After losing baby A, we made sure that there was always a member of our family at her side watching. However, we made a mistake. We started to believe that what happened to baby A was a tragic event that we couldn't have stopped. We trusted that baby B would be given extra special care. It had certainly appeared that way. Little did we know that you were waiting for us to leave so you could attack the one thing that gave us a reason to keep going on in life. 
We are forever grateful that you were not able to take Baby B away from us that night. Although our family has a gaping hole where Baby A should be, there is a constant shining light in Baby B. You tried to take everything from us. You thought it was your right to play God with our children's lives. Our lives are tough. We struggle with anxiety, depression and PTSD. And sometimes we almost want to give up, but we never will. We have a duty to our children. We have a duty to keep Baby A's memory alive for generations to come. And we have a duty to give Baby B the best life possible. And we will spend our lives doing that. You thought that you could enter our lives and turn it upside down, but you will never win. We hope you live a very long life and spend every single day suffering for what you've done. Maybe you thought by doing this you would be remembered forever, but I want you to know my family will never think of you again. From this day, you are nothing. Next, we heard from the mother of Baby C. Baby C was the tiny feisty baby boy, born at 30 weeks and one day. He was murdered by Lucy Letby in June 2015, after she pumped air into his stomach. His mum read her own statement to the court. Here's what she said. I've thought a lot about whether to tell the court about the impact that losing baby C has had on us, whether to allow Lucy Letby to know the extent of our pain. But my need to represent my son and my love for my son outweighs any feeling I will ever have about the defendant. I will always remember the overwhelming wave of emotion that I felt the first time I held him. I understood right there and then the bond and immediate love between a mother and their baby. That moment I will never forget. It was like nothing I have ever experienced before. The shock and panic of the night that he collapsed will stay with me forever. It was so sudden, so unbelievable. It really felt like I was watching somebody else's life, not my own. Our two sets of parents held baby C for the first and only time in the hours that he lay dying. It was a pain for all of us that was just too hard to bear. The trauma of that night will live with all of us until the day we die. Knowing now that his murderer was watching us throughout these traumatic hours is like something out of a horror story. The sleeplessness and nightmares followed. The disbelief that this really had happened, that I would never hold him again that he was never going to get the chance to grow up. I blamed myself entirely for his death. I still live with the guilt that I couldn't protect him in pregnancy or in his short life. There are so many what-ifs that have kept me awake. What if I'd not gone to bed that night? Maybe he would still be here. Eight years have passed. Our grief is just as heavy as it was. But we've worked hard to build life bigger around it to help carry that great weight. I miss him every day. I miss everything that we should have had. First smile, first word, birthdays, Christmases, and the physical feeling of that bond. I think about what his voice would have sounded like, what he might have looked like now, who he would have been, all of the things about him that we will never know, and all the people in our lives who never got the chance to meet him. In the darkness of the days, weeks and months that followed Baby C's death, I would open his memory box, I would smell his familiar smell. I would touch his handprint. His hand and footprint were made into a pendant. I wore it round my neck. It made me feel closer to him. On the 3rd of July 2018, when Lucy Letby was first arrested, these few tangible memories I had of my son felt tainted. She took those hand and footprints. I felt so conflicted as to what that meant, so I stopped wearing them. I needed to understand what part Lucy Letby had played in the death of my defenceless baby boy. Now we know as much about baby C's death as I believe we ever will. I feel able to wear his hand and footprints for the first time in five years. I know now that they represent the love that I have for my son, and I will not allow evil to taint that. They represent justice and the truth. Lucy Letby, to think that you could get any kind of gratification from inflicting pain on baby C and from watching our suffering in the aftermath goes against everything I believe is to be human. I am horrified that someone so evil exists. To you, our son's life was collateral damage in your persistent desire for drama, attention, praise and sympathy. There is no sentence that will ever compare to the excruciating agony we have suffered as a consequence of your murder of our son. 
but at least now there is no debate that in your own words you kill them on purpose. You are evil. You did this. Baby D was a baby girl who Lucy Letby attacked and killed in June 2015 by injecting air into her bloodstream. Her mum also found the courage to read her statement to the court. Here's what she said. Lucy Letby's wicked sense of entitlement and abuse of her role as a trusted nurse is truly a scandal. Lucy Letby, you failed God and the plans he had for my daughter. You even called it fate. After today, I hope to be free of this limbo state I've been stuck in. The heavy load constantly on my mind has deeply changed me. My heart broke into a million pieces the second baby D lost her battle against evil, and that is when hell broke loose for us. Those lives were not yours to take, and although I am torn with sadness, anger and unanswered questions, I cannot forgive you. There is no forgiving, not now, not ever. After my daughter passed, we were asked if we would like her to be an organ donor. This was a very difficult question to answer, but we thought if she could be a baby saviour, as painful as it felt, it felt right to say yes. We were told a baby needed a heart, but very soon they came back to us and said that a post-mortem had been ordered, as they couldn't explain why baby D collapsed and died. Therefore she could not be an organ donor, which broke my heart even more. We had to organise her funeral. You don't choose the date. The service took place the day before her due date. Her ashes were buried in a tiny box on her actual due date. Those weeks were particularly difficult. I couldn't rest or stop thinking about all the things I should be doing instead. My arms, my heart, my life all felt so painfully empty. I missed her so much. I was desperate to feel her, smell her, cuddle her. I needed to be her mum in every way, to look after her and keep her safe. I felt so guilty and questioned if any of this was my fault. Did I miss something? Did I do something wrong? Did I fail my daughter? When I left the hospital, I requested the medical notes and mine. I got clued up on medical terms, neonatal death statistics, guidelines, protocols. I was knocking on doors, asking questions, meeting with doctors from the Countess and even the management team. We got a solicitor and I wanted the police involved. At that stage, I was told this was not a criminal matter, so the police was out of the question. We got the post-mortem report and even the coroner ordered an inquest. Things just didn't add up. A week before we were due to go to court and face the coroner, we got a call at 6am from the police, telling us they were about to arrest someone on suspicion of Baby D's murder and also other babies. I feel not only I lost my daughter, but lost all those years of my life too. Since Baby D passed away, I lived beside my own shadow. I've had multiple therapies, panic attacks, dark thoughts, plus many struggles to overcome. I used to cry every day. Felt so empty. Had a car accident and crashed into a wall. We wanted justice for our daughter and that day has come. Baby E and F were twin boys born in July 2015, but within a few days both had been attacked. Baby E died after being injected with air. Baby F was poisoned with insulin and survived. Their mum read her statement to the court. When our boys were born prematurely, we were both nervous and overjoyed to have our long-awaited family. Our dreams had come true, and both boys were thriving after their birth. Baby E, our little fighter, was breathing without support and growing in the neonatal unit, and Baby F, although needing some additional support, was also doing well. However... On the 3rd of August 2015, our world shattered when we encountered evil disguised as a caring nurse. Losing baby E was the most difficult thing we've ever experienced. The heartbreak and shock left me feeling confused and numb. How could baby E collapse so suddenly after spending the day cuddling with us? The psychological impact on us was unimaginable and devastating. While caring for baby F, we lived in constant fear of losing him too especially during the night following baby E's death. I thought, please, not again. I spent the entire night with baby F, watching him closely and hoping his heart rate would stabilise. It was a living nightmare. Little did I know that the nightmare of pain and hurt would continue, emotionally battering me throughout my children's lives. On July the 3rd, 2018, my family slept in our new home for the first time. 
At 6am, our world was shattered once again with a phone call that took my breath away. We were informed that a nurse we trusted had intentionally caused our baby's death. We felt cheated, deceived and utterly heartbroken once more. The emotional impact on our family was catastrophic. We felt a range of emotions. Why did this happen to us? Guilt consumed me, thinking I was able to save baby F, but couldn't save baby E because I followed the instructions to leave him with Lucy. Trusting my own instincts since this happened became challenging. We were robbed of precious time with our baby boy after he died. We were denied the opportunity to spend private moments with him, having to grieve openly in the presence of Lucy and the neonatal unit staff in Nursery One. Lucy bathed baby E, an action I deeply regret, and she dressed him in a woolen gown. He was buried in that gown, a gift from the unit chosen by Lucy. I feel sitten by the choice we made. Not a single day passes without distress over this decision. Our boys were extraordinary miracles. We had experienced failed IVF attempts, with the conclusion that I would never be able to conceive. Then, out of the blue, on Valentine's Day 2015, we discovered we were expecting twins. That feeling remains one of the happiest times in my life. I felt like I was walking on a cloud. Pure happiness. And that's what confuses me the most. Lucy was aware of our journey and deliberately caused significant harm and cruelty to our boys. No children in this world were more wanted and loved than them. No child deserves what happened in this case but I still struggle to understand why it happened to us. Lucy presented herself as kind, caring and softly spoken. Now I know it was all an act, a sadistic abuse of power that has left me unable to trust anyone. We are living with a life sentence because of Lucy's crimes. Lucy is right. She killed them on purpose because she was not good enough to care for them. She has preyed on vulnerable babies who couldn't stop her. It's cowardly and sickening and I feel like my boys were just a pawn in her sick, twisted game. The trial felt like a platform for Lucy to relive her crimes, and it feels cruel that we had to endure a ten-month trial when she knew all along that she intentionally killed and harmed my babies. She has repeatedly disrespected my boy's memory. Even in these final days of the trial, she's tried to control things. The disrespect she's shown the families and the courts show what type of person she is. We have attended court day in, day out, yet she decides she's had enough and stays in her cell. Just one final act of wickedness from a coward. I would like to thank Lucy for taking the stand and showing the court what she is really like once the nice Lucy mask slips. We have been living a nightmare, but for me, it ends today. Lucy no longer has control over our lives. She holds no power or relevance in anybody's life. She is nothing. Baby G is a baby girl. She was born at just 23 weeks in a hospital toilet, weighing less than a bag of sugar. Lucy Letby attacked her by overfeeding her with milk and injecting her with air. Baby G survived, but she's been left with severe brain damage. She's blind, she'll never walk or talk, and she's fed through a tube in her tummy. In his statement, her dad also told the court she was conceived after many rounds of IVF. For me, what happened has damaged my faith, because every day I would sit there and pray for God to save my daughter. He did, but the devil found her. My wife finds it very hard to trust people in hospitals because of what happened. Our concern is, what if baby G outlives us? Who would then care for her? We need to eat well to keep ourselves as fit and healthy as we can for as long as we can. Everything feels like a constant battle. Her condition affects all aspects of our lives. Even if we go on holiday, meticulous planning is needed. We are limited from doing what a normal family does, like grocery shopping. My wife was in the brownies. She would have loved to have seen our daughter in the brownies. We see other families taking children fishing or playing football, things we can't do. Our daughter will never have a sleepover with her best friend or go to high school and graduate. She will never have a first boyfriend or a first kiss or get married. She will always be in her chair and dependent on adults. B. 
Baby I was born at 27 weeks and was doing well at Liverpool Women's Hospital. So well, in fact, she was moved to the counter so she didn't need the specialist care offered in Liverpool. She was attacked three times before Lucy Letby murdered her on the fourth attempt. This statement from her mum was read to the court. When baby I was born, she was doing really well for a baby born at 27 weeks. After a couple of weeks at Chester, she had her first collapse and needed resuscitation. A few weeks after the first collapse, she had another one. When I arrived at the hospital, they were resuscitating her. I was on my own. It was so scary having to watch our tiny little girl have to fight so hard. We kept thinking, why is this still happening as she's now eight weeks old? And we were told the older she got, it wouldn't be as bad. But her collapses were getting worse. We would get her transferred to other hospitals and she would pick up straight away. Just before her third collapse, she was like a full-term baby. She was on full bottle feed, sat on my knee, very alert. She often smiled and she never cried. She was a very content little girl. But a week later, this all changed. We were called and told we needed to come in as she had another collapse. When we arrived, we were told she'd been found unresponsive in her cot. We were in fight or flight mode. We barely ate or slept because she just kept needing to be resuscitated. After this collapse, she was all swollen and looked in a lot of pain. Her eyes looked very sad. When going back to Chester, we stayed at the hospital as we were too scared to leave her. But as the days went on, she really started to improve. She was back in her clothes and she was rooting for food, but she had to be kneel by mouth for 10 days. So we decided to go back home and spend some nights with our other kids. On the night she died, we were speaking with the nurses in room one. They said at the rate she was improving, there was a chance she could be home for Christmas. We left that night at 10.30, 11pm. Later that night, we had a missed call from the hospital. I felt uneasy, so I called straight back to tell them I was coming in. When we arrived, they were resuscitating her. It wasn't like all the other times. She wasn't fighting. As soon as they would stop, she would just crash. I remember standing by the incubator with my hand on her foot. I was shaking. I couldn't look at the monitors because I knew she was a lot worse than at all the other times. I felt absolutely broken. When they handed her to us, we never wanted to let her go. We held her so tight. She was our gorgeous little princess and I can't even begin to explain the pain. When we lost her, a part of us died with her. I don't think we will ever get over the fact that our daughter was tortured till she had no fight left in her and everything she went through over her short life was deliberately done by someone who was supposed to protect her and help her come home where she belonged. Twins baby L and M were born seven weeks early in April 2016. They were both attacked by Lucy Letby on the same day. Baby L was poisoned with insulin and his brother baby M injected with air. He only survived after 30 minutes of CPR. This is what their mum said in a statement. Being involved in this case has taken its toll on our family and seeing my husband suffer throughout the last five years has been heartbreaking for me to witness. The doctors told us that the whole events that took place in 2016 surrounding my children were normal for premature babies and we believed what the doctors were telling us at the time. Little did we know that a year or so after their birth the police would come knocking on the door and break the news that this could be an attempted murder case. I was second on the scene when baby M had his collapse, as I was still on the ward at the time. My mental health has suffered as a consequence of this case, and I have some good days, some bad, especially as the trial was about to begin and the anxiety levels increased. The boys had to witness their dad suffer a seizure for the first time in his life, which was traumatic for them, and I believe this would never have happened without the enormous amount of stress and anxiety that this placed on us as a family. I've suffered also from restless, sleepless nights throughout this five-year ordeal, waiting for this case to come to court. Her husband also wrote a statement for the court. I was first on the scene when baby M had his collapse, and that image has been forever etched in my mind. The stress and strain have been unbearable at times, and my mental health has suffered as a consequence of this case. I've had to take time out of work and seek counselling. I've also had to take a course of antidepressants to help me cope. Even though they've helped, they can never take away the feelings I have knowing what had truly happened at the Countess of Chester in 2016. I've also had a seizure for the first time in my life, 
and this traumatised my kids, as they were with me at the time. The doctors found no cause for this episode, and this can only be put down to the tremendous amount of stress and pressure this has put on me. Even to this day, I have trouble sleeping as I get flashbacks. The whole case has taken its toll on me as a person. Previously, I was a happy-go-lucky guy, but now I feel burdened with the fact that I was normally a very patient person. My patience has worn thin as time has gone on and has affected my relationship with my children. I would lose my patience with them more quickly than I'd previously done. It's not fair on them. They never did anything wrong. Baby N was the baby boy born with haemophilia. His mother told the court in her statement that she believed her son has suffered lasting damage from the attack by Lucy Letby. She tried to murder the newborn by injecting him with air and thrusting an instrument down his throat on the day he was due to go home, in June 2016. This is what his mum told the court. The day we were called to the neonatal unit was the worst day of our lives. The utter catastrophic scene when we arrived left a lasting impression on us. Seeing my tiny baby fighting for his life, the medics doing CPR on his body, not knowing if he will live or die with no obvious cause. We often hear about people dying of a broken heart. This is how we feel after this day. The pain is immeasurable. I honestly knew my son had been deliberately harmed. There was no natural explanation for his being poorly. I do not know whether it was common sense or mother's instinct, and I said so to my husband at the time. We couldn't keep him safe in hospital. As a parent, it's your duty. This was taken away from us in a place where he was at his safest. We do everything to keep him safe now. If that means wrapping him in cotton wool, then that is what we will do. We now smother him with love and affection because we don't want to see him sad or upset. After everything that's happened, we do not give him boundaries as we never want him to feel sad. When we were informed he was part of the police investigation, we weren't sad, we felt happy and relieved. We felt we were being listened to and finally received some answers about what happened to our son that day. Having to listen to what Lucy Letby did to the other babies weighs heavy on our minds because we know exactly the hurt of those other parents, all because of the evil actions of someone else. We don't want her to know the damage she's left in doing what she did. We don't want her to get any further satisfaction from the hurt she's caused. Lucy Letby's final murder victims were two of three triplets, baby O and baby P. The boys were both murdered by her within a few hours of each other, on her first shifts back on the unit after being on holiday. The night before, she sent a text saying, I'll be back with a bang. She was found guilty of murdering baby O by injecting him with air, overfeeding him with milk and inflicting trauma to his liver. She killed his brother the following day by overfeeding him with milk injecting air and dislodging his breathing tube. The parents of baby O and baby P wanted to read their statements, but they couldn't face coming to court today. So instead, they recorded a video. We're going to hear from his mum first. I was in a state of shock and disbelief. I started to blame myself. I genuinely believed I had passed an infection to the boys. I felt I had infected all three triplets. The images of baby O and baby P's bodies as experts made resuscitation attempts during those days, continue to haunt me. I've only one photo of myself holding all three boys together after baby O passed away. It was incredibly difficult having funerals for the boys. Just deciding what was written on their gravestones was a traumatic experience no mother should go through. The whole ordeal has left me with no trust in any health professional. I live in fear of anything happening to my children. It is a constant struggle when I meet new people and they question me about children and how many I have. I know they mean well, but I don't know how to answer. My son, as he matures, asks questions about his brothers. We've never shied away from telling him he is one of triplets, but those questions are heartbreaking and it is difficult to hide my emotions when answering, especially on the occasions we visit the cemetery. I know my sons also face difficult questions at school, like who is in their family and how many siblings they have. Lucy Letby was the last person to hold baby P, and I must live with that guilt. She has destroyed our lives. It is difficult to comprehend how a person in that position, 
of such high standing could murder my boys. And here's what their father said about when baby O collapsed. I noticed the colour of his skin was changing rapidly. It didn't appear normal to the naked eye. It was horrific to see, and it's an image I'll never forget. Deep down I knew it was not going to end well. He received a blessing from the priest and was quickly christened. Moments later he was gone. I felt like I'd been stabbed in the heart. No words could describe how I was feeling. I kept wishing it had happened to me, and at that time would have gladly taken his place. My partner was inconsolable, extremely upset and visibly crying. I became irritable, angry and bad-tempered and started having terrible nightmares. I hid all of this and didn't share my thoughts and feelings, which placed a huge amount of stress on my relationship. I found it difficult to talk about what had happened. I couldn't grieve properly and became cocooned and insular. Everyday life was difficult. Just getting up and living was a struggle. It was difficult to be happy around my children. I felt guilty if I showed any happiness. Normal life was impossible to enjoy. I never believed that the boys' deaths were natural causes. I knew that something was not right, but it never occurred to me that they'd been purposely murdered. I live in constant fear of something happening to any of my children. Lucy Letby has destroyed our lives. The anger and the hatred I have towards her will never go away. It has destroyed me as a man and as a father. I've missed over six years of our children's lives because of her actions. Even after the trial has ended, it will continue to haunt us and will always have an impact on our lives. That's it for episode 53. You can catch more of our post-verdict episodes on Mail Plus or wherever you usually get your podcasts. We're going to end today with some more of what Mr Justice Goss had to say as he sent Lucy Letby to prison for the rest of her life. For offences of attempted murder, whole life sentences of imprisonment are reserved for wholly exceptional cases. Over a period of just under 13 months, you killed seven fragile babies and attempted to kill six others. Some of your victims were only a day or a few days old. All were extremely vulnerable. They were in a hospital where others were striving to provide them with dedicated medical and nursing care. By their nature and number, such murders and attempted murders by a neonatal nurse entrusted to care for them are offences of very exceptional seriousness. This was a cruel, calculated and cynical campaign of child murder involving the smallest and most vulnerable of children, knowing that your actions were causing significant physical suffering and would cause untold mental suffering. You created situations so that collapses or causes of collapses would not be obvious or associated with you. You removed and retained confidential records of events relating to your crimes and checked up on bereaved parents. There was a deep malevolence bordering on sadism in your actions. During the course of this trial, you have coldly denied any responsibility for your wrongdoing and sought to attribute some fault to others. You have no remorse. There are no mitigating factors. In their totality, the offences of murder and attempted murder were of exceptionally high seriousness, and just punishment, according to law, requires a whole life order. <laughs>